That is a uh, fantastic showreel. So fantastic it actually made the ground shake up here. I hope you had that experience <laughs> as well. Now, John, I got to know you a little bit when we were trying to buy Fargo for Channel 4, but a lot of people here will be less familiar with your career. So can we just kick off by you giving me a sense of how you started in TV and how you've ended up where you are now running FX? Sure. I, uh, I, I really started as a development executive, um, and I guess I would, I would describe that as a combination of an executive and a dramaturg. Um, I worked for a guy named David Manson, who now runs, uh, you know, shows for the likes of us and Showtime and HBO and Netflix. Um, and I started as a salesman. I started as a producer, and he was a terrific mentor in that he also got me deeply involved in the physical process of making. So he made me a, be, be a post-production supervisor and a co-producer and really learn every aspect of the physical aspect of production. And I was an executive at NBC for a period of time, and I was... Uh, the first current executive on the show Friends, and I was a current executive on the show ER, and developed, um, was a development executive on The West Wing, and a show called Profiler, which is how I met my wife. Uh, so I did that, and I, I really didn't like, frankly, my first stint as an executive. I didn't, I didn't like being a part of the corporate side of making television, and thought I would never return to it. I left that to partner with Danny DeVito, and his uh, partners, Michael Shabrick and Stacey Scher, who had a very successful feature film production company called Jersey Films that had made Pulp Fiction and uh, Aaron Brockovich and Out of Sight and a bunch of good movies. And I spent a long time then, again, as an executive producer and a seller, selling uh, properties into mostly broadcast networks, because that was really before the cable revolution in the United States. And again, was quite frustrated with the experience uh, as an outside producer trying to protect the creative process of, of, of interacting with the large corporate bureaucracy that commissioned um, television. And when I was offered the opportunity to come to FX initially as the head of original programming, so I didn't come to the channel to, to run it, and really never thought that I would run a business, um, you know, I was very skeptical, to tell you the truth, about going back into um, the buying side and into the corporate world. Um, but I was just so um, taken, frankly, by the riskiness of the choices they were making in programming. And that was, that was really the early wave of cable. So I think, I think we in the United States really look at The Sopranos as, as a sort of dividing line between, you know, sort of before Sopranos and after Sopranos. But, um, but the FX was really the first uh, commercial supported television network to try to do that kind of, I guess I'd say more braver, more sort of premium cable content. Um, you know, The Shield was really the first of its kind. And, and I was just, you know, very excited by the prospect of taking those kinds of risks. And, but it's been quite surprising to me. I've now been there for 12 years. I never thought to run a business or be an executive again, and, um, but it's been a happy place. So it's interesting, because when you talk about your early career, I suppose, is it that you're picking up a sort of risk aversion when you're at NBC? Is it that what really attracted you to FX, do you have a fundamentally different mindset when you're at a network to the one you have at a cable channel? Yeah, look, for, for one thing, I, you know, NBC is, was at the time, I don't think this has, bears any relation to they may or may not be now, but they, they were very large, and they, and they were... <coughs> They were really a factory that made hundreds and hundreds of hours of television. And I just didn't think that the that sort of factory mentality, even the notion that, uh, that a factory has, that we should produce uh, um, objects of uniform size, shape, and quality was uh, applicable to what television does. I also thought there was, a, um, I guess, some sense of arrogance about who was actually making the shows. Um, when I was there, I was, I was actually, I worked with David Nevins, who's also here, who runs Showtime now, and there were 23 executives in the production department, and David and I were the only two that had spent significant amounts of time in, the, in an editing room and really understood the way television was made. Um, and guess, so I guess I felt like I was a gatekeeper at that point, uh, trying to make sure that things weren't too original. I, you know, yeah, too interesting. <laughs> Um, by the way, there were a lot of really gifted executives at NBC, many of whom I'm still friends with have gone on to terrific things. But, but ultimately, I think that the U.S. television industry at that time was, it was, too, um, it was too restricted. There were too few buyers, and I think the buyers really were, were, were a little arrogant, to tell you the truth. So you've been at FX now, and you've had this extraordinary tenure. So you've been there for over a decade, which is very unusual in this country. And one of the things that strikes me when we look at that showreel is you have and this might, this might come out wrong, almost a sort of European public service sense of wanting to make shows that say something about the world. That runs through a lot of what you've done. So when you look at your time there, I says, what are the shows that really define you that are your FX? Well, I actually didn't commission The Shield, but I worked on it from the third uh, episode on, and, uh, and it was a show I, I dearly loved. 
and, and a show that I think finished very strong, and I, and I will take uh, some measure of credit in supporting really the people that made that show in making, uh, I think, courageous choices about how to finish it. Um, I, I absolutely love Nip Tuck, and Rescue Me is a show that's not on that reel, but, um, but it was a very unusual show in that it was about a terrible <laughs> tragedy, uh, the aftermath of, of the 9-11 of the tragedy, but it was a very profane, extremely comedic show. Uh, Damages was another show I was really quite proud of that we commissioned. Um, and, uh, and then we got into the comedy business, and that's been a terrific business for us. It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia is a, is a kind of a unique show. It will ultimately run, um, it will be at least the second r longest running live action sitcom in American history, which is just stunning to me mm -hmm. since it w we made it for uh, virtually no money and it had no prospects when it started. And it was but made, by the way, by, by young writers who had no prior experience. I mean, literally none. The, the guy that created it, Rob McElhaney, was a waiter, and he didn't quit his waiter job when he was running the show in the first year because he figured, well, the, how long will this last? Yeah. He didn't quit his job as a waiter <laughs> until we picked up the second season. Would you, would you put that, because I think one of the interesting things about running a channel I still find extraordinary is often it's the shows that you least expect to work that pop, and actually, in the sense, that keeps you humble, doesn't it? Because you can never be sure it will work. What's the show that's most surprised you in the time you've run the network? Is it that? Yeah, it'd probably be It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. I mean, for one thing, it, it's also made an enormous amount of money, and it's made these young people that came to us initially. I mean, they shot, they shot that pilot uh, on, uh, you know, consumer equipment before consumer equipment was any good. Now it's quite good, but they shot it in their backyard. I remember when we, when we made it, we gave them four hundred thousand U.S. to remake uh, the pilot that they'd made, and I got a frantic call from uh, one of our lawyers saying, you know, we, we didn't account for the fact that we have to pay for the uh, for the original pilot, and it's not in the budget, and it's two hundred thousand dollars. And I was like, no, 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 you don't understand. Go call them again. It's two hundred dollars. They're asking us basically <laughs> to pay the, <laughs> the pizza budget from the first pilot. Um, and uh, look, I think that I think that that what that keeps you humble, humble about is I think it's quite easy when when you're um, in these jobs, as you know, to be a heat-seeking missile and to only go after brand names, and who can really criticize you for making another show from Armando Iannucci, right? Nobody. Uh, but I think really where the, where the greatest fun and the greatest satisfaction comes from taking people who are new. The guy that made The Shield had never run a show before. Kurt Sutter, who made The Sons of, uh, Sons of Anarchy, had never run a show before. The guys that made Damages had zero experience ever running a television show before. The Always Sunny guys had never done a show. The Archer people had never done a live action show. Yeah, Louis C.K. had though. never done a show before. And that's, to me, that's really, really fun. Well, let's talk about that, because one of the themes that runs through a lot of the way you talk about your career is being a friend to the creative community. And what's striking when you talk to people in LA about John is they will frequently describe you as the creative's creative, that you're on their side. But what I find fascinating about the way you work is you are also famous, and you've said it many times on the record, for watching every rough cut of every episode of a show that goes out on FX. So, It'd be fascinating to understand how you do that. So you want to give that voice, that authorship, but you also want to make sure that shows go out that have got your editorial imprint and a sense of the FX brand. How do you do that? Well, I guess I, the way I would say it, I mean, I think there's something a little fashionable about, about right now about saying that uh, uh, being a friend of creative is to simply uh, uh, leave, them, leave them alone. And I think that's often a, a, a true statement, but I guess I would put it a different way. I think you, I think you show what you value by, by what you pay attention to. Right, so if you, if some of us in the, in the room are parents. I think there's, there's, a, there's a fine line, there's a middle ground between neglect and uh, you know, micromanagement. And I think if you love your children, you pay deep, deep attention to them, to their every gesture and their every move, but you don't try to control them, basically. You're there for their, for their growth and their development. You understand that essentially it's their life, it's not, it's not yours. And so, for me, I don't know how to be a friend to creative if I don't pay close attention to their work. I think one of the things that I learned early on as a development executive is that if I'm trying to give somebody a note from a point of view that's outside of their intent and outside of their creative process, it's really of no use to them. It, look, it might be helpful if they, if they don't know anything about um, who you are as a buyer, they don't know anything about business, and they need to learn something that's extrinsic to their intent that they have to be mindful of. But ultimately, as a creator, as a writer, what they need is they need someone who understands what they're trying to achieve, deeply understands from the core what they're trying to achieve, and can help them evaluate to what extent they're achieving what they intend to achieve. And I don't know how you do that without reading and watching and really trying to understand what's going on. So I'm not someone who really believes in uh, that neglect 
is, uh, is, is, uh, is positive for the creative people. I think, by the way, I often choose to do nothing. I often choose having spent all that time reading and all that time watching and all that time engaging, and I have a very, very gifted group of executives, and we watch the rough cuts together. We don't watch them at home. We watch them in the office because we want a common point of view, and we often decide to give no notes or do nothing. But if you're not deciding to give no notes and if you're not paying attention to those moments when someone actually really needs some input, how do you know the difference between when to do nothing and when to do something? What's interesting though, do you mean you don't give notes because it's a ride fully formed and you're happy with it? Or yes. you don't give notes? Okay, fine. So, but in terms of the dialogue that then takes place, because it's interesting, because when you're watching as a group, so you've got group feedback, you might have group notes, and you've got a creative in the room. How are you delivering that message then? Look, I, every time I've ever talked to a creative person, I think the first thing I've ever sought to do is, is, is um, have them understand that I understand what they're trying to do. Uh, I think of it as analogous to being a coach of an athlete. Why should an athlete listen to a coach if the coach doesn't understand mm -hmm. uh, the unique challenges and you know, uh, that the athlete's going through, right? Unless you know something about the sport, why should they listen to you? And there's a lot of experts in the world who, who will tell you, uh, you know, their, their expert opinion on something and know absolutely nothing about what they're talking about. So for me, it's always to first reflect upon the work, really, really try to celebrate it, try to understand it, try to talk about what's good about it, try to understand what the intent is, and then we can start to get into where, uh, where it, might, it might, not, might be missing the mark. And, I, and what I've found over and over again, um, this was a fascinating thing for me with Louis C.K., is you know, Louis had had such, uh, oftentimes we have people come to us who have such uh, uh, traumatic memories, really, of working with uh, executives who've, who've uh, made it virtually impossible to, for them to do what they set out to do. And so, you know, when Louis C.K. came, he was offered, you know, well uh, more money just to write a script than we offered for the entire budget of the pilot he made. And, uh, and I said, well, and he said, but I, I can't do notes. I can't, I can't write anything down. I can't, I don't want to do a, a story outline. I don't want to have any notes. And I said, okay, well, look, then if we want to do this way, I'll, I'll give you the money and you give me the, the show and we won't have any conversations in between. And then he started to want to more money, right? And I said, well, look, I have a responsibility, a fiduciary responsibility to the shareholders of my company. I can't give you that much money and not give you notes. And he said, <laughs> okay, well, I'll take the lower amount of money. So ultimately, <laughs> so I was like, okay. So we, it was fascinating. We wired him. You know, I think his first year he made uh, 13 episodes and, he, we, and he'd made the pilot, so there was 12 and he was spending about $400,000 a year. So we wired about $5 million to his bank account. And I was like, gosh, I hope I don't get, I, I hope the next call doesn't, isn't from the Bahamas. A lot of jealous people yeah. in, John. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and he, gave back us, he gave us back these brilliant, brilliant shows, but he called me partially w w the way through this, the first episode and said, you're a, you're a fucker. And I said, what? He said, you're a son of a bitch. I said, what do you mean? All I did was give you money. He said, yeah, but I can't blame anyone but me if this isn't the greatest show ever made. This is a work of genius, right? I think, what you've done there. And, um, and then ultimately he came to me and he said, you know what, I really do want notes. He said, I really, it's, it's actually difficult for me because we would, the, the cuts would come when we'd watch them. I'd often send him something saying, you know, good job. Um, but he said, you know what, I'm, I'm finding it too dry, essentially, to make these and send them out into the ether, and I know that you're aware of everything I'm doing, and I know you watch these carefully. I really want you to call me after we watch them. I want to have a half-hour, 45-minute conversation about what you like, but also what you didn't like. So, um, it's that's a tricky model to replicate, though, isn't it? I can't imagine us wiring money out across the world, yeah. hoping that people will come back and ask notes. A lot of what you talk about, which I think resonates with, with the market here, is around risk-taking and about doing things that people don't expect. And oddly, in a strange way, I put Fargo in that category. Mm -hmm. I mean, in many respects, people think that isn't a risk, but I'm sure people here remember when you announced that you, it was an audible intake of breath either side of the Atlantic, that you yeah. should dare to remake an iconic film like that. How did you go about approaching that? And did that feel more frightening than going into a space that had never been gone into before or less frightening? Well, I, I, I personally really love the film Fargo. Uh, it's one of my favorite films. And um, I really didn't want to be the guy that, <laughs> that made a crappy television series based on a really good uh, uh, movie. And, um, and so I felt it was really risky because I thought, well, really, what are the odds that we would make anything that would be um, anywhere near as good. I mean, that film, the American Film Institute put it on one of the top 100 best American films. You know, but the material was good. And I come back to that over and over again. Um, 
a lot of times I just go with the script. I just go with what I, what I think is good writing. And of course, I may be wrong. I mean, I am wrong frequently, but, but all I have at the end of the day, all we have, I think, is our taste, is our judgment. And I just thought that script was extraordinary. I was like, well, I don't, I asked myself the question, okay, this, this could be a really, truly embarrassing disaster. But on the other hand, could I imagine not making the script? And I thought, no, I have to make the script. It's just too good. I think what's amazing about that, because as you say, I mean, it turned out we know the history of Fargo, critically acclaimed, award-winning, high rating. Thank you for that. Very grateful. Um, what's interesting about it, though, is it could have been a catastrophic disaster. Yeah. There was a genuine possibility of that. And there's an amazing quote about the way you deal with failure, which uh, I was really struck by. John said, success has many parents. Failure is an orphan. But if you really want to get good, you have to adopt your failures and accept them as your children. And I think... As an industry, we often talk about failure and people pay lip service to it, but it's also met by deafening silence. You know, no one wants to talk about the ones that didn't work. So what, what does that phrase mean and how does it resonate for you day to day? Well, it's, it's really awful. I mean, I mean it's, really, I, it's awful. really awful being in these jobs because um, <laughs> everything is um, obvious in retrospect, right? So ultimately, when you made a good decision, it looks obvious in retrospect and... Um, and anybody would have made that decision. But when you make a bad decision, it's also obvious in retrospect. And you know, I, I guess, uh, you know, famously, I we developed, um, we commissioned and developed the pilot, the script for Breaking Bad. It was a really good script. Uh, we had two really good scripts. The other one was Damages. Um, we had three shows on the air that had male antiheroes. We had Rescue Me, Nip Tuck, and The Shield. I looked at Breaking Bad and I thought, um, well, that would be a fourth male antihero. Are we the, is FX the male antihero network and brand? I would like to have a diversity of point of view and opinions. Mm -hmm. This is a female antihero. Uh, I had worked with Glenn Close in The Shield, had helped convince her to come to The Shield. I wanted to do a series with her. So I let Breaking Bad go and I picked up damages. And I'm very proud of damages, but if you look at that in retrospect, that's probably the most colossally stupid decision any, <laughs> you know, any programmer has it's ever like made. It's like a form of self-flagellation. I was just waiting for the stage to be stormed by people going, you idiot, yeah, what there have you, you go. done? Um, but I can tell you as somebody who lived the experience that it was not, it was not self-evident from the beginning. Look, it was a terrific script and Vince Gilligan was a really good writer, but we didn't have Brian Cranston. We didn't have much of what that show became. A lot of what it became, it became after that script was written. Uh, and I looked at that afterwards and I said, okay, so I've already suffered the worst thing that could ever happen, right? I already developed arguably one of the greatest dramas ever made. Do right? you want to one stop of... talking about this soon? I'm finding no, it No, I don't, I don't have a problem yeah. with it because no. ultimately what I realize is, okay, that's inevitable. How, do, how does anybody do one of these jobs for an extended period of time and not make mistakes? And, and, and then I came back to, so we arrived at the, at the, uh, the, the, the moniker for our channel, which is Fearless. Uh, after I'd been there for I don't know, six or seven years, and I thought, well, that's, this is a mission statement. Really, ultimately, uh, it's, it's easy to be fearless uh, it, you know, if, you wanna, if, if you never fail, but if you're, in a, if you're in a position where failure is inevitable, public humiliation, <laughs> defeat, and failure is inevitable, um, then, then it really is something you to try to You seem really remain. nice, John. I feel that I should sort of put my arm around you. I think it's, it's okay. come out all right in the end. It's come out fine. I mean, how, you do, know? how do you deal with... Cause, so that, that was sort of like watching a man shoot himself in the head repeatedly, so we'll just stop there for a second. But when something's not worked that you've commissioned, what's your version of managing that? Because that's failing as well, isn't it? I mean, it yeah. goes out, it gets... My euphemism for this is it was a discreet performer, which usually means it <laughs> tanked on an epic scale. Yeah. But how do you deal with that? Do you sit around in a similar sort of way and talk about where it went wrong or... or or do you park it and move on? Or you know, I'll use I'll use I'll use a kind of business. uniquely American analogy, which is that back uh, when when uh, uh, we slaughtered virtually, there were great herds of buffaloes on the plains, and we, we <laughs> slaughtered all of them. And it, and at times they would shoot buffalo and literally just cut out their tongues and leave the carcasses rotting on the. And I thought, well, this is and, and my attitude is, well, you know, okay, the buffalo's dead, right? We've shot it; it's dead. Are we going to cut out the tongue, or are we going to use all of it? Like we're going to use all of it. So when we have it to failure. We take it, we put it up on the failure and say, and, and we talk about it. And I think, look, I, as somebody who also runs an organization, I think what I learned is I needed to, I needed to own failure and I needed to give myself permission to fail. If, I, if you don't have permission to fail, I don't think you really have permission to succeed. You have permission to be lucky, but you don't really have permission to take the kind of risks it takes to succeed big. And so then my point of view was, well, okay, look, my job is to um, extend that... 
My, my job is to accept my failure and have a generosity of spirit toward myself. I have to do that toward the creative people that work there because ultimately they have to be able to do their very best work and that means they have to take big risks. And I have to do that with a staff that works with me. In other words, we went through an entire process where we made it clear that the, the goal of our organization is not to not fail. It is to succeed spectacularly. And ultimately we accept that failure is a part of the process that leads towards success and therefore we shouldn't be ashamed of it. We really should, and we, all we should do is we should try not to fail this, the precise same way twice. We should, once we fail, we should say, okay, we failed that way. Let's learn how we did that and let's figure out how not to do it again. And then inevitably, you'll figure out an entirely different way to fail, <laughs> <laughs> you know? I can understand why that's very important when you've got a, a mandate or an expectation that you'll be fearless. But I suppose one other way of measuring success is whether something gets recommissioned or not, isn't yeah. it? And you've spoken very interestingly about how you weight the different opinions in that decision. You know, it's a bit about you, but it's a bit about other people. Talk us through how you do that. Yeah. Well, I guess the way I put it is I, you know, I, but when I say I, I really, I, I'm here as uh, representing and as part of a large organization. It's not me. It's a group of people. We get a vote. The critics and the various bodies that award, you know, give awards and acclaim get a vote, and the audience gets a vote. And, um, you know, any two votes and, and you move forward. So uh, a hit that the critics hate will probably pick up, and a, something the audience doesn't watch that the critics think is one of the best shows on television will probably pick up. Of course, we're always aiming for, for, it, for, for all three. Um, but then there comes this subtle thing, which is sometimes we have to overrule both the critics and the audience. Um, if we really believe that there's something that has potential. And, and we've done that over and over again. We've picked up a number of shows. I mean, uh, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia was not a, a successful show out of the gate. The critics didn't like it. It wasn't a, a massive hit by, uh, um, you know, at least as we, as we define it, by audience standards. We just thought it was good. So sometimes you have to stick to your guns when you really believe something's good. But to do that, you have to believe you're going to take one of those two votes yeah. and convert it to your side. And sometimes you don't. So. You know, I've renewed shows that, I, that I, I wish I hadn't, but part of the problem is you're always making decisions, and I'm sure you'll not at this, based on too little information. You just don't have the information you need to really make proper good decisions. And so it comes down to a lot of intuition. And you have to say, well, can I imagine this being a great show? Can I imagine it'll be uh, better this next year than it was this year? And I think unless I think unless you create you you leave a little bit of slack in the rope, right? I think it's just such an imperfect process we go through that you have to approach it with humility and you have to leave a little bit of slack because if you try to uh, if you if you think you can make rational decisions about everything and control everything, you're you're literally delusional in these well, jobs. It's amazing. I mean, we are inundated with data, and yet in the end, there's something in your tummy which says this will get there or it won't, and it's often defies right. reason. But it's interesting when you talk about those two bases for recommissioning. It's rated. The critics hate it. It's rated. You may even hate it. Right. Or you love it, but we can't get an audience to it. What's the sweet spot for you? I mean, obviously the the nirvana is it rates and everybody loves it. But if you had to go one way or another, what is closest to who you are as a creative? What matters well, I want to make. I want to make good shows. I really want to make good shows. And, and ultimately, um, there will always be a ton of very highly rated crappy television. Uh, and, I, that, that, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not what I want to do. We want to make really good shows. And I, and I think for me, it, um, what's always interested me is, that, is, that, is the Venn diagram where that rare uh, piece of literature is also something that's quite populist, right? So to me, I'm very mindful of the fact that, you know, Dickens and Shakespeare were populist writers, mm -hmm. but also wrote some of the greatest literature uh, of our language. And so that's what you're really, that's really what you're aiming for, is that rare show that's a great, great entertainment and a Absolutely. great piece of literature. Now, you made headlines globally, actually, with something you said at the TCA a couple of weeks ago. John went on the record saying, quite simply, there's too much TV, which is an extraordinary thing to say. What did you mean? Yeah, I'm sure that's a really popular statement in a room full <laughs> of prospective television producers. Um, well, I, look, I, you know, I've talked to you a little bit about this, but I just ha I'm sensing a, a little bit of a malaise, to tell you the truth. And, um, and I think that we, uh, I think it's really great that we have a, 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 a much wider diversity of uh, stories and, um, and protagonists and writers. So I've looked generally at the expansion of, uh, of, of, of voices in television, and that's something that's really benefited us as a good thing. But, there's this other notion that you reach something called the paradox of choice, which is you give people too many choices and it breeds discontent because ultimately 
it's very hard to pay attention to all the choices. It becomes work, essentially, to sort through everything, every opportunity you're giving them. And whenever you choose something, you're unchoosing something else. And so you get this vague sense of malaise that, that, that even when you're watching something great, there could be something greater that you're not watching. And I think the thing that concerns me is that I feel like television has become work on some level, not just for me. It is work for me, but it's <laughs> become... I don't know how to break this yeah. to you. It's your actual <laughs> yeah. job. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But I think for consumers, uh, at least in the United States, it's become work. It's really uh, laborious to try to pay attention to all the great television. And, and uh, look, it's been wonderful. Uh, you know, partially it's been the relative demise of independent film in the United States and the fact that we've had a massive migration of really genius storytelling into television with, uh, with greater flexibility. It's been great watching television become good, so good, but when it's, when it's proclaimed good, uh, it just starts to become um, important. It starts to become a lot of things that I think uh, are actually detrimental to its health on some level. Again, back to Dickens and Shakespeare. These are, these are writers who made really, really, you know, compelling entertainment. They didn't, they didn't set out, I think, to make something important. I think what they wanted to do is, is write things that were deep and good and reflect the times that they worked in, but they wanted to entertain people. But what's fascinating about it, and I, what you're talking about, I think in microcosm everyone's familiar with, you've got you know, a load of shows at home that you sort of feel you, sh you should have watched yeah. and that you can't really function culturally because you've not seen Insert the Name of the Show. But it's a bit, it gets a bit like global warming then. It's sort of overwhelming, isn't it? So yeah. there's so much choice and you don't really know what to do with it. So where does that argument get you? Does it mean that people like you and I should be commissioning less, we should be commissioning better, that there's not enough good TV out there, there aren't enough good writers out there? Or where does it get to? Because with all of these new entrants, there's more and more money, more and more demand for content. Yeah. It's not about to stop, is it? So once you've made the observation, where does it take you? Well, look, I guess I would say is that, uh, you know, I run a business. So, so I, by definition, that I'm a business person, but I don't think that business's first priority is, um, is, is the creative health of, uh, of narrative storytelling. I think that's very important uh, to you, it's very important to me, but I think ultimately business wants to make money, right? And if it can make money by limiting choice and, you know, if it can restrict us to three channels and it can base in, which is what the United States had for years and years, and it can have a uniform set of voices, it'll do that. If it's in a situation where it seems like money can be, be made making a seemingly infinite amount of television, it'll do that. And I guess I would say is that there's, a, to me, I've, I've come to believe there's a kind of an optimal inflection point. Uh, again, I said uh, famously that there are more than 400 scripted original television series in the United States this year, and that's too much. I think that, by the way, I think when we made a couple hundred shows, which is still a vast amount of television, mm. that was probably too little. Mm. Uh, and so I guess what I would say is I think that ultimately I see, I think I see business kind of eating the, eating the creative tail right now. There's a, there's a feeding frenzy. There's a sense of, of great amounts of money to be made. And, um, and ultimately I think all businesses, all industries basically go through, they overexpand and then they mm -hmm. consolidate. And I'll, all I can say is that in my, in my view, I think that um, I think less would be more. I think a few, uh, you know, 300 television shows would be better than 500 television shows. And I, I know that's heterodox to say as a, as someone who makes TV, but I but I just sense that we're making too much for it's the consumer. Party game. Which hundred would you get rid of? But we yeah. won't play that now. But I mean, I yeah. think that, that there's something which has got real consequences for the creatives in the room. Actually, I mean, one of the examples I know you've given is the launch of your show, The Comedians, with Billy Crystal, which actually right. I, I rather liked. And I, again, I think it would be fair to say we would put in the euphemistic, discreet performer category oh, yeah. of ratings. But the point you made, which I think there will be people in this room who've seen it happen on network television here, is it launches. It needs a bit of time to get into its stride. By episode three or four, it's sort of got its groove. By which point, you can't get an audience to it. You can't get critics to yeah. it. It's died on its ass. That's the end of that. So. Yeah. What do you do about that? Because, I mean, that, from either a business or a creative point of view, is a real conundrum, isn't it? We've seen it here with big launches for shows that then drop away. I mean, how, how do you tackle that? Because it means you're, they don't get a chance to grow and become established in the yeah, way they would have right. done years ago. Well, and, and um, look, what you saw when, in, the, in the American feature film business is, is, is that as, the, um, as that began to happen, right, as it became colossally more and more expensive to market in a more crowded field, um, it actually hurt creatives in the long run because essentially then uh, the, the big studios collapsed down to brand names. Uh, they started to make show, they tr started to make uh, movies that were global in their focus as opposed to um, culturally specific. Uh, they started to spend more and more and more on special effects. In other words, I, I've seen what happens in industries when this happens, which is ultimately 
the money-making in instinct takes over, and again, we st and, and ultimately we stop taking risks, right? And so if you think about it, um, you, you need a situation where you have a very, very healthy number of shows because you want to be able to take risks, right? You can't take as many risks when you're making 100 shows as you can when you're making 300. But if you get to the point where you're making too many shows, guess what? That's also going to hurt the process of risk taking because ultimately you're going to end up with a situation where people say, well, I don't know, I can't get an audience for this and I'm going to have to put more marketing into it and you know what? Um, we better make a, we, you know, we better make the pilot more commercial. We better, we better start making things based on brand names. And I think you're starting to see that right now. And with critics, you know, I've come to the point where I see that they can't, they, they just are thrilled when they think your show's bad. <laughs> because they have a pilot that's, they have a pile of things to watch that's so deep that the minute they can say so this sucks and put it they're looking for something they don't yeah, like. Yeah, because then it's okay. off the pile and then they don't have to worry about right. it anymore, which is fine so if, if your show actually sucks. if you're a critic in the room and you want to ask John a question, please send it in on the yeah. app for you. But if your show's good, you can never now get them to go back and reconsider it. And that's the thing about creatives. I've watched creative for years and years and years. Pilots are really a hard form. They're really a hard form. It's, it's, it, it's, it's just very hard to pack that much frankly, exposition and world building into a short narrative form and have um, room for character and room for story and the things that captivate you. And in fact, for everybody who's ever created a really good television show, it always gets better once you figure out what the world is and what you figure out the tone, you figure out the writing. So I feel, I really feel for creatives. If essentially their, their entire future and the, and, the, and the quality of their show is going to be judged on the pilot, that's really unfair because every show gets better and better and better and really doesn't find its, its full form until deep into the run. Now, I know you're an optimist, because you told me you have, but you're depressing me now. So there's <laughs> too much television, and we can't get people to watch it, and the industry's sort of eating itself. So talk me through, how do you deal with that? I mean, there's been a lot of talk at the festival about Netflix, about Amazon, about new entrants, about the amount of stuff. How do you see brands like yours surviving? How are you going to continue to be fearless in that world? Well, I, I, guess, I, I guess I would say that I think Maybe what defines us uniquely as a species is, is storytelling as much as anything else. Uh, we don't know for sure that whales and dolphins don't tell stories, but we think we're probably the only species on this planet that tells stories, and we love them. And we will always love them, and we will always do that. It is a uniquely human function. So I'm not somebody who's saying, I think storytelling is going to go away, and I don't think the television industry is going to go away. I think we're all going to be just fine. I think what happens is... Um, you go through times that are really exciting and dynamic and times of expansion, and then you go through times of crisis and contraction. And, I'm, and what I'm saying is I think that you know, we're headed for a time that will have some level of crisis and contraction. And by the way, not at Netflix and Amazon, which are still very much in the expansive phase of their, of their development. And again, I think that's a good thing for, uh, for creative people. But, um, but I guess a different way of putting it is, um, you know, and. For years and years and years, there was a constipation in the U.S. television business because it really came down to a few broadcast networks, and it came down to the notion of least objectionable programming for the most part, making programming that, that didn't offend somebody and that everyone in the world could sit and watch together in a room. And so you had to make something that would appeal to a 70-year-old and a 5-year-old and everyone in between. And there were some very good shows made of that model, but there were a lot of really good shows that couldn't be made. Now, all of a sudden, when you had a fracturing of that marketplace, it was, a re it was, a, it was an incredible boon. It was a relief. Because then you could just make a show for the adults when the kids were in, were in bed. Or you could make just shows for kids that the adults didn't have to watch, or just shows for women, or just shows for men. And all of a sudden, it was really exciting because you could drill down and focus on much more specific points of view. And you didn't care whether you offended people that weren't in the target for your audience. And that's been fantastic for storytellers. Um, when that becomes so fractured that we lose the ability to actually have a common dialogue about television and it becomes everybody literally sitting in their own room watching their own individual screen, I would say that we lose something out of what is generally a mass medium and, what, and, and these stories that we tell can inspire you know, great debate and they can inspire great passion, but they need a certain critical mass to do that. So again, I think you have danger at both ends of the spectrum. You know, too little fracturing and you get hidebound and constipated, but too much fracturing and you have this just sense of diffusion. 
And I think that that's what I'm feeling about television, is it's just kind of... It's not it's that optimistic, though, is it, really, when you put it like that? Let me ask you, you've got a room full of British producers. Um, this is not a fishing expedition, although a tiny bit is, actually. What is your sense of the vibrancy of this particular sector? I mean, there's been a lot of talk this week about, you know, Americans looking in, thinking, aren't we all great? Is that... Do you think that's right? Is there a sense it's a very strong and vibrant part of the way you assess what's evolving in the industry? You mean the UK industry? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think, I think from... As long as I've been alive, some of the very best television shows in, in the world have been made here, and, and certainly many of the best television shows in the English language, and, and I think that really continues. Um, you know, the reason we, we, um, we're so active in this market, we set up a UK independent company called DNA TV, is because we think some of the best writers in the English language are here mm -hmm. and would wish to work with them. And, um, and so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm one who, I guess my attitude is I may, I may feel highly competitive with with any uh, anybody from from a UK uh, you know from the BBC or Channel 4 to Showtime or HBO or Netflix but I think ultimately I have to give it up for somebody that's making a contribution to a medium I really love mm -hmm. and I think there are, there are just a lot of really good contributions being made here good right got a few minutes some questions this is uh, I don't know who asked this actually how often do you get pictures shown you think no that's too risky for my liking mm. I don't. I think. I think the risk. You I, not for my liking. You know. Look. I do have. I do ultimately have to believe that we can figure out how to market a show and find an audience for it. So, um, I may really like a show and f and feel like. I don't think I can do that because ultimately I think what we bring to the table is we have to really really get behind the artist. There's no half measures. Once once we've decided to back something, we back it to the hilt, and our entire organization, everyone in it, all of our marketing is brought to bear. And I prefer not to fail, so I'd like to believe that there's a possibility. But no, for me, my personal taste is the riskier the, risky the better. I just really love it when a, when a storyteller um, has an idea hasn't, ha that, that, that's dangerous that I haven't heard before that might or might not work. Now you're going to have lots of uh, box set devotees in this room now. So if you were predicting what's going to be the next thing that you can feel guilty about not having watched, what would you say it should be? Mm. You mean, a, you mean a new television show? A new show. show on your network or other shows on other networks that you wish you had? Oh, there's so many shows I wish I had. What do you wish you had? Apart from Breaking Bad, I think we've done that one. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, like, I, I think vinyl looks pretty good. That's the new Martin Scorsese thing that's mm -hmm. coming from HBO. Mm -hmm. Sight Unseen, kind of wish I had that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's quite a short list, I think. Yeah. Any other questions from the floor? I'll ask one here. You said the race for the best TV is between FX and HBO. Are you winning? No. I don't, think it, I don't think that's a race that can be won. I think it can be run, but I don't think it can be won. And I think HBO is just really good. Honestly, they're good, but they also have vast resources. We're, we're, we're a little, um, you know, we're, we're a fairly substantial uh, company, and I have a large budget now with which to commission programming, but we're small relative to the scale of... Uh, uh, HBO or Showtime, so uh, or, or Netflix rather. So we're we're always trying to, in some ways, find the next thing uh, rather th rather than um, you know than being in business with Mr. Scorsese, which I would like to be. But what you happens know. to you next then, John? Because actually, when the big Fox job came out, it was speculation all around LA that you'd go and get that, and then obviously Gary and Dana went and did it. I mean, are you happy where you are? Does yeah. it give you the kind of creative freedom that you want? Yeah, no. This is this is the right place for me because uh, I don't. I don't. It's not for me. It's not this. It's not about the size of the business. It's really about the ability of the business to to commission and make things that are worth making. And um, and I really I really like the kinds of shows. That, you know, I would watch some of the shows that we make. Many of the shows that we make. Uh, so for me, premium premium cable or or what we or AMC do is really my sweet spot. And I, and I don't. And to be honest with you, I don't think it'd be any good at. Uh, at running a broadcast network. To be blunt, I don't think I would be good at it. That's interesting. So let's, f finally then, if you had to pick one show from your own showreel that you think will be your next big thing, which is the one that you've secretly fallen in love with? Uh, well, I'll have, to, I'll have to pick two. The, 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 you, you saw a brief moment of, uh, of, of American, I'm, I'm only talking about things that haven't aired yet. You yeah. saw a brief, brief moment of American Crime Story, The People versus O.J. Simpson, which is just a, a phenomenal, um, set of scripts written by uh, uh, these US uh, feature writers named Alexander and Karaszewski. They wrote The People versus Mary Larry Flint. And it's, it's just a really, really wonderful, subtle satire. Uh, and that's terrific. And then 
you saw a very odd moment from a comedy called Baskets that stars Gal Zach Galifianakis um, as a man who dreams of nothing more than being a rodeo clown. That's a very strange, but really, really. It is very strange, but it's definitely very, worth it's watching. It's really yeah. wonderful. So uh, those are two things I'm really excited about. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll looks really good as well. Yeah, it is good. It's quite good. Are we wrapping to the end, or have we got time for more questions now? OK, fine. Questions, yeah? Right, any other questions from the audience? I think the app has failed miserably again. Yes, at the back. We've got a mic. It's going to be painfully slow now. I'll just pass it in a very old-fashioned way. Can you say who you are? Hi, John. Uh, Peter White from Broadcast Magazine in, in London. Um, a big fan of, of some of the comedies that you've launched recently, uh, You're the Worst and, and Married. Um, and Thank I you. gather last year you signed a, a deal with Sky to, to co-produce comedies. I just wondered if you could give us a bit of an update on that and if there's potential for, for British producers to work with you on, on that sort of thing. Um, yeah, look, I mean, some of the best comedies uh, have always been made in the UK. Uh, and obviously, uh, the UK has some of the funniest and best comedians. And it's an interesting uh, conundrum because I think there, there are comedies that work only in the, in the UK and don't work in the United States, and there are comedies that work only in the United States and don't work in the UK. I think there are uh, notable differences in some cases between uh, your comedic sensibilities and ours. And yet, um, you know, I think what we felt with Sky is that that's not always the case and that we would try to locate the sweet spot where um, something could work uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, I don't think we have it yet, but I think we're looking and I, and I remain optimistic that we're gonna find it. What a question. You've got a question. Sorry. <laughs> One more question. I'm funny as I can't deal with the miming. Anyone else from the audience? No? no. Well, look, I hate to, I, I don't wanna leave, I don't wanna leave on a, on a really skepti skeptical note. I, I think my, my, um, my penchant is just really towards honesty. I guess I, I, guess I just feel like um, unless we kind of absorb the challenges that we face, and you and I talk a lot yeah. about the challenges that we face, and the fact that we're going through a really, really radical time of transformation in television, which is a, a daunting, I think, but really good. Mm -hmm. I think ultimately all television is going to be distributed, you know, over the internet ultimately, and it's going to be consumed in different ways. Um, and uh, and I'm really not a pessimist in the sense that I think that uh, that change is scary. Uh, but it's ultimately good, and I and I and I will say this: I I I I may be now identified forever with the notion of the guy that said there's too much television, uh, <laughs> but I but I but I really do think it's been a great thing for the television uh, business and for storytelling in in general. That so many diverse voices and so many different kinds of people that never would have gotten to create a show, and run a television show have been able to get a show. And you've seen, I mean, that's the thing when you create. Um, when you create opportunities, you see this, this great flowering, I guess I would say, of, uh, of things that you never believed could possibly happen. And so that's been really exciting. I guess for the last 15 years, there's been what I would call just a great flowering in, in television. Um, and, I, and, I, and I don't think there's any going back from that. That's the good thing is I, I think ultimately now, I think the question is what happens when every kind of story that you could possibly imagine, that's what it is. You read stories now and you think, it's very hard. I never hear or read anything where that doesn't feel derivative anymore. When every story's been told, right? When they're all being told simultaneously, then, then, then you ask yourself the question, well, what's the thing that's just going to leap out of the pack and that's absolutely going to blow my mind? That's going to be the thing that I feel like I've never seen before. And we've had so much of that over the last 15 years that I think, I think in, in some ways we're, we're choking on our own abundance. Somebody um, described what it's like as winning a pie eating contest every day, right? <laughs> it's great, pie's great, but if you're gorging on pie all day every day, eventually. Well, I think I'll be the optimist then. I think you and I have frank conversations about this. In a weird way, it's apocalyptic and the world's changing, but it also comes down to the simplest thing in the world, which is you find great ideas. That's and right. there's now money coming into the market to make great ideas from great British producers right. as well. So I think it's all all right, I here, think, here. John. I think here, it'll here. be all right. Here, here. Right, um, <laughs> we're going to wrap there and say a massive thank you to our sponsors, the British Film Commission and Creative Scotland. I was worried they were going to fall on our heads. Thank you very much, John. It's always a huge privilege Happy to talk to, to you. Thank, thank you so you much for coming.